There's this thing called A3. Anybody know what an A3 is? There's many answers that are. Anybody know what an A3 is? Yeah, paper size. It's a paper size, dude. <laughs> yeah, yes. it's a pa A3 is a paper size. The way we're thinking about it now is what the lean folks, and lean is the grandfather of Agile, if you will. And so in uh, lean, there's a thing they use problem solving. They're trying to distill problem solving down into a piece of paper. Because if we take all these like high-minded thoughts and all this data and we can't break it down to like what really matters and tell the story, then we're never going to get to to be able to convince it to the, the auction or the the uh, the people out there on the floor or management or whatever. So A3 is just a pro a way of thinking and systematically solving a problem with a constant like evaluation and work with our people to say like, hey, this is what I see. And this is what do you think? So they break it down. This is from like lean.org, uh, the, the lean folks. And they're saying like an A3 documents our thought process and distills. So instead of saying, hey, I'm going to come and try to solve a problem and I'm going to do all this work in the shadows and then I'm going to come with a perfection. They're saying, don't do that. It's scared and it doesn't involve people in the process. So what they say is like, hey, as you're rolling, lay it out on a piece of paper. You might have reams behind you, but like break down the background. Like, what are we talking about here? Hook the audience. So people go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then as you build it out, you're like, hey, I went out and looked. This is what I see as the current condition. These are the graphs. This is the data. Does this resonate with you? What do you think? Does this work? And you're constantly, they call it nimawashi, like going out there and sharing. This is going deeper than you need to. But what they're doing is they're breaking down as they step through the process to bring people along, which is a very agile or uh, concept, right? We're, we're bringing them along in the process through the counting measures, countermeasures, through the plan, through the follow-up, did it work? So it's a way to visualize the thought process of simplifying the question solving. So a piece of paper is called an A3, so they just call it A3 thinking. So if they if you see anything related to that, that's what they're talking about. Agile coach. Now we hit hard like uh, scrum master, product owner, dev team, sponsor. There probably will be mentions to an agile coach. Okay, agile coach is like um, the scrum master's boss or guide. And if you think about an organization, there needs to be somebody or multiple people that are guiding the evolution of the organization as they go toward agility. And so, yes, scrum masters will be working with teams, maybe multiple teams, but like there is someone that's usually working with executives directly framing up how the old experience is going to be. So an individual with knowledge and experience and agile who can train, mentor, guide an organization through the transfer. Often they're like the scrum master's ball as they go through there. So agile coach, don't be thrown off. It's like a super agile. Now these things called anti-patterns. Anybody ever heard of an anti-pattern? Yeah, yeah. Do you say yes, Brandon? Do you not? Oh, I have, yeah. Oh, tell me what it is. The, yeah. the, the exact wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the way it is. It's like, instead of having like happy path, happy path, happy path, when we think through things like, just like he said, what are all the ways that we can crash this boat? This crash this boat? Yeah, you can crash a boat. Uh, crash a plane. Like, how can we do it? So, a flawed, a known flawed pattern work that's not advisable. I know that every time it feels like we are creating wildly new things, but in reality, most humans just follow the same patterns as others. I'm no different than anybody else. So it's like, what are those patterns? So it's like, how could we screw up an agile like an agile? And as we start asking ourselves there, we'll identify agile anti-pattern. So if we wanted to screw up a daily scrum, very easy to do. All you got to do is like, don't have a routine. That's an agile pattern that will put you into the rocks. Uh, treating it like a status meeting with any kind of heart, soul, and connection. Mindlessly reading our progress. That's an agile, agile pattern that or anti-pattern that'll put us into the rocks. Deep diving into problem solving and not being respectful of people's time and isolating or not thinking about our progress to the sprint goal and just being, a, you know, oh, we're just floating out there. There's many more infinite anti-patterns for hitting a daily scrum in the bad way. But it's just like, if we think about the ways we can screw this thing up, then we can be appreciative of them and we can engineer them out. But like, what would we do if we didn't want to operate with no path? Do it. So it's like flipping. And a lot of times thinking in the negative guides us more toward the center path. Now, there's this other thing called broken cone. We talked a lot about it, or we talked about it occasionally. They also call it paint drip. What we got for broken comb? Anybody know? So like, here we go. Uh, broken comb, it refers to a person with various depths of specialization and multiple skills required by the team. So like every person on earth, like is good at something and not good at something else because they don't have the experience, capability, or aptitude or whatever, but they're growing. So they framed it as, hey, it kind of feels like, I don't know who broke this comb. I don't know what kind of battle this comb's been in, but it's been a rough one for this comb, dude. And so like, there's some, I don't know what you call these things, comb pieces that are like really long which would be like, yo, in interface design, this person is like the cat's meow. They're great. But in setting up these queries or programming in Ruby or whatever, they're not so fantastic. They just don't have the skills, the whatever, the experience. And so as we're looking at each person, we want cross-functional teams. And a lot of times they talk about like I-shaped people versus T-shaped people in the like capitalization method. 
Like you'd say like, Hey, one specialty in I, and then like, Oh, the T-shaped people spread out. So that's like a very shallow way to look at it. Like we are not a monolith where it's like all my experience goes like a thin wideness, like a personal pan pizza. It's like, no, like, dude, I got little, I'm good at this. I'm bad at that. And so each person has their own little comb for me, potentially growing comb, or they might call it like a paint can or a paint drip. And that's like, if you think of the end of a set, the outside of a paint can, like after you're using it, there's like little drippy drips that go down. So all they're basically doing is saying like, hey, where are you in these skills? So the team could look at themselves and be like, I'm good at this, that, at that. And then the team and the product owner could look at like, what's the work that's coming down the road? Do we have the right mix of folks? Who do we need to partner together, et cetera, et cetera, to use this strategically to build our skills, attack the work and all that junk, or do we need to bring in new people? Talked about those, right? It's a graphical representation of burn down is how much work's left, burn up, how much time we got to go, how much we got to go. And it could be story points, which is the amount of complexity in the work. Could be like cards or whatever you want to say, jobs to do, doesn't matter. It's just the visualize, yo, we got to get this much done in this much time. 10 days or whatever the time box is. And we got to get down to zero. That's the goal. And then every day we just plot how many we got done. How many we got done? How many we got done? Or how many we got left? Try to land the plane by going closer and closer to zero. Are you a glass half full or empty person? This is for you. It's just like how much have we done versus how much we got left. Going to the same place. We started at zero. Try to do a bunch of work. We're at day 10 and we're not there. So we almost achieved our goal. But like as you're running the scrum, daily scrums and stuff, you know, the team can evaluate and move toward it. Information radiators, we talked about that. So it's instead of the person that radiates information, it's like a, a, a place that radiates information. So you're on it, dude. Uh, and so a physical, physical display that provides information for the rest of the organization, enabling them to keep up to the minute knowledge sharing without having to disturb the team. That sounds all fancy. It might look like, hey, we have a what they call a common area. We're like a, a hallway, a center of a room, somewhere where people like traffic, right? They go a lot. And we'd say, we got a wall, let's use it. Like, let's make it big, let's make it visual, let's make it clear. Let's put the junk on there that people can see. Agile's all about transparency, inspection and adaption. This is the, the the transparency part of it. Let's put like the Kanban board up there. Maybe it's like a ginormous screen so everybody can see what works going. Maybe we see the roadmap. May we see like the burn up or burn down chart. May we see a list of like key issues, blah, 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 blah. May we see the backlog. Everybody, look at these two little folks. They're sitting talking and this guy's got his hand on the card. Uh, everybody can see it. It's really easy. Information, radiation, mobbing is a technique where it's like, hey, let's throw multiple people simultaneously, developers on the work to drive it to a better place. Look at this example. Bunch of, there's five people around a computer screen. This guy's pointing. This guy looks like he's typing. This guy's thinking hard. Like, so these guys might be programmers. Okay, we got to accomplish this thing. Maybe we're running through a test or we're building it on the fly. And then this guy's a tester. He's looking at it from his tester eyes. This person's maybe a QA, a little bit different UI, whatever it is. They're looking at it from their eyes just so that we can like mob or jump on it. It's like ants on a thing. Like we're all going to attack this to get it to the end it's called mob. All right. So a little bit different than uh, just thinking about crashing in like the waterfall sense where it's like, hey, we need another person that works the drill press. So throw another drill press person in there to like work the same job. This is like to make the work more robust and resilient to like attack it in a good way. It's also this thing called pair programming in the same flavor. It comes from XP, extreme programming. You don't need to be experts in that. But what they found is to make a like same words I used previously, more robust, resilient solutions. A lot of times it paired, paid to have two people build it in tandem together. Just like the, we solve questions like a leader and a helper. Um, what we were doing is saying, hey, that's Kent Beck, one of the dudes that popularized it. Um, he says, write all production programs with two people sitting at one machine. Cool. All right, Kent. Uh, and so just like this does not require that they wear the same color shirts, but these guys chose that. But they're like, look at this guy. He's kind of pointing. This guy's driving, right? So we have a driver and a navigator. That's this guy. And so the driver is building the things, doing it. And the navigator's thinking about, well, what are we going to do next? Why would we do it? How does this work? Blah, 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 blah. Just kind of working back and forth. And these folks, as they go through, can switch. Hey, I've done it for like an hour or so. Let's switch. You be the driver. I'll do the navigating. Whatever it is. More robust. Everybody's got different eyes and we're checking. It. So like this little example says like a lot of knowledge sharing, a lot of reflection on what's happening. Keeping everybody on focus. Be like, dude, I think we're getting off. They can keep each other. We're doing like code review or process review on the, on the way. Gets two different people's brains in there. Brains are never the same. They each end up owning it. Like that's our stuff instead of your stuff. It's our stuff. That's not bad. And then keeping whip low. Work in process. Work in process. Yep. Yep. Good. Good. See, I'll go back to you. 
Like, good job, Brandon. Um, a song. Yes, Jack. And so after we finish this, Jack will sing it. But like, uh, why is pair programming keeping our whip low and how would that help us, Sienna? I am really sorry. Can you say that again, please? I'll try. Like, uh, if we pair program, how does that keep our whip low? And why is that a good thing? So it's going to keep the work in progress low because you're just, you've like taken away half of the group. So you just yeah. can't mm -hmm. do that full amount. You have to only do half. And I guess this is a good thing because it is allowing you, I guess, to focus more or what am I missing? Devo, what you got, Jack? So, so, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I think it's a good thing because then it's, it, you don't have all these like questions about work, right? There's only like so many things in, in flux and then the two people are working through it together. And so you're basically getting double the overlap and like that with the cone yeah. in my mind. So then like, there's just, there's less to talk about. And so you're just, mm -hmm. you're focusing on these things and you're making, the idea would be you'd make faster progress on fewer things. Yeah. And less coordinate. Yeah. I love it. And less issues on the back end with like, oh, the testing. Cause we're like doing it during it. So it's like, we're doing it right. The first time we're finding those problems, iterating quickly inside the iteration, if you will. And we're, we're flowing it through. So great job, less quality errors, less, uh, rework stuff like that. So although we're out of time, I didn't have Jack sing, but like, we don't have time for it. You don't so want to hear me sing. It's yeah, a punishment. that's all right. So spike this, I think the last one we're doing. So we've talked about spike a teensy bit. It's like a railroad spike. Like that's a terribly drawn railroad spike. Something like that, where it's like, it goes down and it comes. So it's a short time interval within a project, usually a fixed length, like, hey, take four hours. Let's do this. Uh, during which a team or team member conducts research or creates a prototype on an aspect of a solution to prove its viability. So in English, that means, hey, man, we don't know how to do this. We don't know what it will look like or whatever. Figure it out. Don't take forever. Take like four hours, do a little research trip. We'll stay out of your hair. Like roll and tell us what you find. So that's what we're doing. So uh, answering a question or gathering information, there could be like, you got to realize it's an investment of time. And we're making like, like an assertion to do it during like a sprint to say like, hey, we're not going to actually build the thing. We're going to learn about the thing. Yep. To research something, to understand the architecture needed to build something or to refactor. Refactor is to take a solution and make it simple.